This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Dave Meyer, your host of On the Market. And today we have a pretty great episode for you. We have Mike Simonson joining us, who is the founder and CEO of Altos Research. If you have never heard of Altos before, it is a real estate data company, one of the first out there, at least that I became aware of. It provides information to real estate investors, home buyers, financial institutions, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and Mike and I have a fascinating discussion about how to analyze your market in really good detail. And we talk a lot on the show about how you have to know your local market data. But in this episode, in the first half or so, we really talk about the specifics, like what actual data you should be looking at and to to really understand your local market. And then because Mike is one of the foremost experts on the housing market out there, I do pick his brain a little bit about what he thinks is going on in the housing market, where he sees it's heading over the course of this year, and what data points you can look at to find the quote unquote signal. Basically, what data points really matter in this crazy, confusing economy that we're in. Before we jump into the interview, I just want to say, full disclosure, at Bigger Pockets, we do license some Altos research data. None of that really comes up in here. I just want to let you know that if you do download some of the data ever from Bigger Pockets, we do get some of that from Altos and just wanted to make that clear. But with that said, we're going to take a quick break and then jump into our interview with Mike Simonson from Altos Research. Mike Simonson, welcome to On The Market. Thanks for joining us. Dave, great to be here. Well, I've known you for a while, Mike, but could you just please introduce yourself to our audience for those who don't know you yet? Sure. I'm Mike Simonson. I'm the founder of a company called Altos Research, and we track the housing market. We Every week, we track every home for sale in the U.S., all the pricing, all the changes in pricing and the supply and demand, and we bubble up all the analytics for, for people who, who care about such things. Uh, we do a lot of work with, with the realtors and help them inform their clients about what's happening in the, the local market. Um, and we work with big institutions and, and, uh, Wall Street funds and, you know, home builders that who also need to understand what's happening right now in the real estate market. Investors, of course. And, um, and we've been doing that for 17 years. Um, and, uh, I'm a longtime Silicon Valley guy d done data software for my whole career. And I just happened to roll into the real estate space, you know, 20 years ago when I, when I bought my little old overpriced Silicon Valley piece of junk house, you know, <laughs> with a giant mortgage and I'm 30 years old and, and I needed to know what was going on. And so I started building data at that time. Uh, and, and it ultimately turned into Altos research. That's I honestly, I didn't know that story that there was sort of just, you you fell into it. You're a very prominent thought leader on housing market data. And I figured you had a real estate background. Yeah, no, it's, I have a data background and, uh, and I have data visualization and how do you really communicate with data and what is the data actually saying and 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 so i i applied that to you know to housing and and it's hard to think about now but so i bought a house in in silicon valley in 2001 as i like to say two bubbles ago <laughs> and it was like you know you're buying this 50 year old thousand square foot house for a thousand bucks a foot and, and, you know, it's, it's nuts. And then on top of it, at that time, the NASDAQ bubble was bursting. And, and so home prices in Silicon Valley and in the, in the town I bought in Los Altos, it, it home prices fell by a third in 2002. Um, but what I was noticing is because I was tracking every single home is I noticed that I'd bought the cheapest home in Los Altos and it was still the cheapest home. And so while the median price in Los Altos fell by a third at that time, the bottom didn't go anywhere. And, and so 
uh, like that, those are real insights that I could start to share with people. And I did it personally for a bunch of years before we started realizing we had more uh, information, more than anybody in the world uh, on, on the housing market. And then suddenly it was the housing bubble and there was a, it was a real time to, you know, crazy time to start a uh, housing data company. But, but that's when we launched it. That's a, that's a great story. And I, I do want to get your, your take on what's going on in today's market in just a second. But can I ask you, why is it that real estate data has taken so long to evolve? It just seemed like, you know, you started doing this 20 years ago. No one else was doing it. A lot of this data, or at least a lot of, there was a lot of publicly available data. What What do you think has taken so long for real estate to sort of catch up to the you know, the level, let's say, of the real the stock market, for example, where they have abundant data for investors to use. Yeah. So there's a, a few things that go on. One is that housing is actually a lot smaller data than stock data. Like there's five and a half million home sales a year. Like it's not that big. Mm. Um, and so like stocks, you know, move every second and there's massive amounts of data. Uh, the other thing that happens is home sales are very, uh, they're very local and they're controlled very locally. I like to say that the, the U.S. housing market, because it has, you know, 700 local MLSs and it has, you know, they don't talk to each other and, you know, they, they work with their realtors, but they don't really have a mandate to inform the public and like all of these competing interests. And in the U.S., the U.S. is, um, the U.S. housing market is so messed up that that nobody like Altos existed yet. We, they, <laughs> it's they, too scary. It, it didn't exist. On the other hand, much of the rest of the world is even more messed up. And so Altos couldn't exist in that in a world where, like in France, you still got to know the guy who's got the listings, and he has the listings because his father had the listings, and and nobody knows anything. And so in a lot of the world it's even more messed up. And so there's this, this market dynamic that, that caused that. And, and, you know, the, it's, you know, it's really fascinating. Like when we were, we started, you know, I quit my J job January 1 of 2006 and I started doing Altos full time. And in 2006, you know, this is when the, the bubbles, there were, you know, moments of the bubbles, the subprime started breaking and, you know, 2006, 7, 8. And, you know, people can tell you now what the median home sales price was at that time, but nobody could tell you how many homes were on the market. What's the days on market? What they, you know, what were, how many of them took price reductions? They, nobody tracked those things. And a lot of that was because, you know, the local MLSs, especially at that time, were not very technical. They didn't have a database. They had, they had a list of homes. And so nobody tracked any of that. And so suddenly, you know, I'm looking at Altos and I'm like, there's so much signal in, in all this data that's got, you know, these homes haven't sold yet. Like they, the sales price is in the future. And so there's all this signal that, that nobody had. <clears throat> all the academics couldn't do that work because there's, they, they could do it a little bit of work. They might get listing data for LA, but they couldn't do it nationally because there were 700 different MLSs. And so none of the academic work had been done before Alto started building all this data nationally. And now we have, we do a lot of stuff with, with universities and stuff, but, but that's why you, you know, the only academic work that had been done really before that was like, we can get tax record data. So let's go look at the, the home prices based on tax records. Like that's the, that's what had been done up until then. Yeah. It's, it's really progressed tremendously in the last, whatever, 15, 20 years in large part to what you do. I want to talk about you. You said that there's a lot of signal in there, and for those people who aren't don't have as much of a data background, there is sort of a saying, or it depends how you word it, but you you have a lot of noise in data. Um, there's a lot of information, and what you try and identify is the signal. You know what information, what data is actually helping you answer the questions that are relevant to you, or help you predict the future of home prices, or whatever you're trying to predict, really. So what 
you know, now 15, 20 years into this, Mike, what data do you think provides the strongest signal for real estate investors? You know, so we focus at Altos on the active market. These are the homes listed for sale. These are the prices. These are the changes in prices. Um, and what's happening is that you can think about this progression, uh, you know, where traditional housing data is about the sold price, the, the how many homes sold and what was the price. And so that's backward looking. Uh, like we know now how many, you know, how many homes sold in March and what the prices were. Um, or we, in some places, we don't, still don't know what March happened in March yet, right? But if we look at what's on the market right now, we can see uh, wh what, where the homes are priced now. We can see how many of those took a price cut this week or how many have taken a price cut. Is that accelerating? Are those price cuts accelerating? So if you're on the market now and you don't get an offer and you do a price cut and then you get an offer in May, and then that deal closes in June or July, you start in the traditional sense to look at, you start to get that information in August. But we can see right now that 29.5% of the homes in the single family homes on the market in the US have had a price cut, 29.5% right now. And that's significantly fewer than the start of the year. It's And it's declining, which implies that like, hmm. If you and you you know this if you you're actually in the market like there's been a surprising amount of uh, of activity this spring like buyers are are buying stuff and you can see it in the price reductions you know or you look at the you know last year at this time price reductions are climbing rapidly each week because that mar the brakes were on and so that's the signal that you can see and these are these are sales that haven't happened yet. But it's but those there's and there's the the active market is rich with these signals that don't even that you never see in the sales data, like the sales data is, you know, you look at um, number of sales, and so how many homes sold, and uh, it's very tempting to use the fact that very there are very few homes selling right now. Uh, relative to normal times, it's very tempting to, to use that and say, oh, there are no home selling, therefore there's no demand, right? But it turns out we're in a supply constrained market. And so if there was more supply, there'd be more transactions. So like the signal is about how much supply is there and how much that's changing each week and how much that changes relative to where it would in the middle of April in normal years. There's all kinds of signal like that. And how do investors use this type of data to give themselves an advantage in their decision making? There's a there's a, a bunch of ways to do it. Uh, you know, one is to say like, if I'm making an offer, I know that I may know how much competition there is. I know how uh, long those places are on the market. So this house has been on the market for 21 days. Is that a lot? Or is it is it not a lot, right? Are there, you know, you know, did the ones like are we seeing each week prices tick up because we know that there are overbidding, or are they ticking down because they're not bidding? Um, we, you know, we can so we can use that to uh, understand where we need to come in as an investor. How quickly do we need to offer? How how do can we walk away? Are there going to be more options? Those kinds of things that we can do. The other thing that we do that was really a personal thing, when I bought that, that cheapest house in Los Altos, you know, I bought a thousand square foot house and there were you know, multi-million dollar homes in that neighborhood. And I, you know, had the plan to expand the house, add a thousand square feet and, and you know, make a lot of value equity right away because I could build less than it was selling for. Um, and so what I do, what we do at Altos is we, we look at every market in four price range segments, like the high end of the market may be behaving very differently from the low end. And so I could see that I'm buying in the bottom quartile 
And if I go from 1,000 square feet to 2,000 square feet, I can see, I can see where the 2,000 square feet homes are selling in the next quartile. I can see, but I can also see that I'm not going to go to the $3 million homes because those guys are on half an acre or, or a full acre and I'm buying at a quarter acre. So I can see those characteristics in that. And, and so I was able to use it, you know, when I was shopping for a home going, I'm buying in that, that low place and I want a place where I'm going to be able to invest and add value to my home. And so using that, those four price range segments is really powerful. Sometimes you might say, you know, might look and you see, like I'm buying in the, in the bottom quartile and, uh, and it's like, if I want to move up a price range, what's the days on market in that price range? Is it suddenly 180 days or is it seven, right? Like those kinds of things that we can use in every zip code in the country. That's great insight. We talk on this show a lot about the differences between different geographic markets. And I do want to ask you about that and how different markets are behaving differently. But to your point, the further you can refine your analysis, the better, like even within a given market. So, you know, you're in the Bay Area and we know that that's probably seeing a bigger correction right now than Boston is right now, for example. But even within the Bay Area, some segments, some neighborhoods, some, you know, houses with three bedrooms versus studios might be performing really differently. And for everyone listening, it just shows that the more detailed you can get in your analysis, the more opportunity you have to sort of unlock those little nuggets of information that are going to allow you to take advantage of value that most people aren't really doing the legwork to to find out. Is that something you you preach or, or talk to people about, Mike? Yeah, for sure. It's it is about how do we make those decisions? You know, for me, you know, I was working with a realtor and that that you know, time and, you know, my realtor was a guiding me to a different town B, you know, like you're going to make an offer quick. And I was like, mm, you know, wait, I, like I, I'm going to count up. How, do I have other options here? I may have other options here. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of decisions that allowed me to make that informed uh, insight better. And it's really stark. Sometimes you can see, like, I like looking at, you know, days on market by price range. So you go, Hey, I know, you know, down the street, like, that house has been on the market for six months. And then we say, oh, yes, but in your price range, like it turns out it's it's moving in 21 days. If if you want to you want to get this, you want to act quickly. So, yeah, that, like we we do that all the time. And like that's really when we craft the data that we do. It's about what problems are we trying to solve here? And and there, there's definitely ones I've lived. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that story. I, I bought a, a short term rental a few years ago and was able to do something similar. I tell this story a lot, but basically I could see that uh, prices for anything three bedrooms and under were just flat. And they were in town, they were just building tons of one and two bedrooms. So that probably means that they're either going to go, they might go down with an increase of, of supply. Whereas no one was building big homes and the prices of four bedrooms and up were just going up and up and up and up. And so I only targeted my search and created my buy box around finding those four bedrooms. So just a, uh, you know, two data nerds talking about the importance of data analysis. But I really do think it matters that when you're looking in your market, don't just stop at saying, OK, I understand at an MSA level, you know, what, what I should, what I should be looking at, try and learn everything that you possibly can. Um, and you might just uncover some, some of those valuable tidbits that we're talking about here. Yeah. You know, I've observed that, you know, the great investors, the long-term investors, a lot of them know this stuff in their bones for their local markets. They're like, that's the bargain, right? You know, that's the, that one is the rare one. Um, but most of us, either don't yet know it in our bones or we have to convince other people. And when, you know, when we convince other people, it's, you, you can't just go, I know it. Like I've been doing this, trust me. Right. So the data is very often convincing other people who may be super scared right now. Right. So if you've got an investor or, you know, I had a hard money lender call me the other day and she says, I've worked with these investors, um, before they buy homes in Denver, she said, I'm nervous about lending to them in Denver right now. And she said, what do we know about Denver? And she's like, I'm afraid the market's tanking. 
And I said, well, let's you know take a look. A, we know that Denver slowed faster than most markets last year, but B, it's actually recovered very quickly right now. There's fewer homes on the market and than you would expect. And so she was suddenly like, oh, maybe this is an option. We looked at the we looked at the four price range segments that she that 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 her investor, you know, clients were were looking at and could they and it was a real good move from the you know, and it was a I think a 750k range to a you know a million four range next step up. And so like we were able to look at that and she was just operating from fear. She wasn't going to lend them money. Mm-hmm. But she was like, let me check with Mike and see. And so we dove in and it was a really insightful check for her. And so, you know, for those, you know, the, the operators, like they needed to convince her to do the deal. That's yeah, that's a perfect example. And and so it's not just investors, but even real estate agents probably need to be talking to their clients about this lenders, everyone. Yes. All right. Well, now, hopefully, Mike and I have beaten this into your head that you should be understanding your market as well as possible. But Mike, since I have you here, I do want to understand because you are, uh, you know, one of the foremost authorities on the housing market. Just got to get your take on let's start at the national level. What do you what do you see going on right now? So the biggest surprise of the year has been, and it's really, it was really between the first and second week of January, we could see a real shift in buyer demand across the country. And, you know, different from the third and fourth quarter of last year. It, and, you know, we were going into January assuming that inventory would be keep building. We'd have slow buyer demand. Rates were still on the sixes. You know, we would, we would still have that. Um, and it suddenly didn't happen. So people were buying. Um, and so we have, there are 410,000 single family homes available on the market around the country this right now, only 410,000. Now, last year at this time, at the peak of the crazy pandemic nuts, it was 260 or something like that. But normally there's like, 800, 900,000, a million homes, single family homes on the market. So less than half, something around half, half 50%. Less than half, yeah, ish, exactly. Yeah. Wow. And so that was a big surprise, right? So it is, so the first observation is that it is significantly tighter inventory with greater demand than, than we expected for sure. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I don't know anybody who was, you know, going into January going, well, people are going to be buying this spring, <laughs> you know? No. Um, and, and so, so that was really noticeable. Um, the, um, home prices, we have a, uh, you know, we, we have a several indicators of where home prices are and where, and depending on how you want to measure them, where they are and where they're going to close in the future. Um, Two of our three indicators there are lower than last year at this time. So by a couple percent lower than last year at this time. So what that means is, uh, you know, home prices dropped in the in the uh, third and fourth quarter of last year. Um, they're not dropping now, but we're going to see a lot of headlines for the next several months of home prices are down. Because they're down over these really strong comparisons of the first half of last year. And so, you know, first half of last year, prices spiked up and then they receded back down pretty quickly. And so the yearly comparisons are, they're down, like they're down just a touch from last year. And what it shows us, though, are these are homes that are on the market now, new listings now, like each week, where are the new listings priced? And so those are down a little bit from last year at this time. Um, and but these are homes that will sell in the future, and so they're on the market now. They get an offer in May, they close in June or July, that kind of thing. And and so you know you can pretty much see through like August. The headlines are going to be pretty bearish, scary. Home prices are down, and so I think about that. You know, from an investor standpoint, my favorite times are when we can be contrarian and bullish. So the headlines are really bearish. And as of right now, the, the market's holding up significantly better than a lot of the headlines would indicate. And it's going to be the case uh, through, the, through much of this year that the headlines are going to be bearish. Now, if, you know, economy tanks hard, big job losses, you know, that, the, the people might stop buying and that, might, that trend could back off quickly. But as of right now, there's significantly better um, 
uh, demand and and on on tight supply than than those bearish headlines would suggest. And and like there's no signal in the data right now of further downward pressure on prices. So like each week, there the comparison to last year gets a little worse because it was climbing through end of middle of June, but uh, but there's not they're not going down now. Yeah, it, it's honestly been fascinating and happened faster than I expected personally. And I'm just curious, like, how do you make sense of it? What do you think is going on here? Uh, like the recover, oh, like a, a, a recovery happened faster than you might have expected? Yeah, I'm just curious, I guess, two things here. One, why did demand come back? I know mortgage rates forever know, you know, for this tightening cycle, at least for now, have peaked about in November. And so they were ja- down in January. So is that why you think demand came back or what? sort of spurred this increase in activity in Q1 that I was personally surprised by. Yeah. Um, I th- so I don't know all of it, but, uh, you know, I suspect that, that yes, rates down from seven and a half to six and a half, like that makes a big difference. And now, and, you know, a lot of buyers are buying down further to five and a half or something like that. And a lot of folks are realizing now that they, they can buy now, and when rates go down in the future, I'll refinance in the future. And if I'm qualifying for the higher rate now, it only gets better. So I think there's a lot of that psychology that's happening. Uh, the other thing that's happening is, as of right now, everyone in America has a job. Mm-hmm. And so employment is really good. And so even if you know people are worried about the economy and about a re- recession, they still look to their own pocketbook and they're like, well... I'm doing good. Mm -hmm. And so there is still that uh, dynamic is still really strong. Now, maybe second half of the year that changes. But as of right now, um, that's that is got to be driving a lot of it. So we have, you know, strong, like surprisingly strong economy. We have, you know, rates are some were lower. You also have this big demographic of millennials at their peak earning and home buying years who've been getting screwed for three years during the pandemic by big cash buyers, by the boomers. And so now that we have a little bit more inventory than we did last year, it's not a lot, but it's more than last year. Like it's at least a little less comp- competition than it was last year. And so some of those folks are saying, I finally get an opportunity where I don't have to go into a massive bidding war. I can just, you know, go. And, and so like I've been shopping for two years and maybe now is my opportunity. So I think you get like all three of those things happening. And it turns out that that like, you know, people are uh, less afraid of, you know, economic uh, turmoil than those of us who spend, you know, all day on Twitter. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, about. exactly. Obsessing over <laughs> macroeconomic indicators. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, the we talk about it from a uh, investor perspective, the lack of competition, and there's still competition, especially in some markets, but a decreased level of competition, as you said, um, for investors is a benefit. But I imagine that might that's probably even more dramatic for home buyers because as investors, it's a numbers game. But for a home buyer, like the the value of being able to actually like go and you know, see the house that you want, <laughs> that you might spend 20 or 30 years in before you per an offer in is probably very high. And, and I, I think it's hard to quantify that, but it's a really good point that that really might be pulling people into the market. Yeah. You know, you can also see uh, the less competition, even for investors, um, we can see that the mega investors, the the big Wall Street funds, the ones that own thousands of homes, are their purchase rate is down like eighty percent year over year. The i buyers purchase rate is down like ninety percent. So those the big money competitors are on the sidelines. The mid size investor operators, mid and large size, uh, they're they're only down a little bit, right? They're still basically doing business. And then the small size, the individual ones, um, are down, uh, you know, there's fewer people buying like like mortgages at 6%, pencil out 
less often than mortgages at 3%. And so the opportunities are, are tighter for the individual level investors. And so those are off some. And so you can, but you can really see the folks. Um, and, and so that means like we're not competing with the big dollars right now and the big I buyers. And that's like, you can feel that opportunity in, in a lot of markets. That's that's really interesting. It kind of makes sense to me, honestly, that like it's hard for the big ones to do programmatically. You know, they need to do it at such scale. Whereas from everything I hear about the market is, you know, people are finding good deals, but it's taking a lot of offers, working with sellers, identifying motivated sellers. It's probably hard to do at scale for those big guys, but the medium and, and small time investors, many of whom listen to the show, who are really hustling, might be able to find some better deals, which is uh, hopefully encouraging for everyone out there. Uh, it feels like it. Like those are the folks who like you take the mega money out the 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 money the the money that existed only because of zero percent interest rates like mm -hmm. you take those out of the market and the people who like really are operator investors are like they're still they're still doing business and it's uh, you know it's it's hopefully uh, you know a lot more efficient and less nutty kind of market than we've had in the past. I have two inventory related questions for you because you are always talking about inventory and you, you know it better than anyone. So two things. One, let's talk about new listings. So uh, this is a, a measurement of how many mar uh, homes just get put onto the market for sale. And for reference, I think last time I saw they're about like down 20 percent year over year or something like some, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, th that's right. Yeah. About 20 percent fewer homes getting listed every week than would be than were listed last year at this time. And so for everyone listening, that, that basically means, um, especially coupled with the relatively higher demand than I was expecting, at least, is leading to that really low inventory that Mike was alluding to. So there's a lot of theories. Uh, I won't lead the, the witness here. So what do you think is going on with, with new listings and why are they down? So there's a, there's a few... I think pretty direct reasons. One is that the normal part of inventory would be I'm moving up or I'm moving down. Um, and uh, so I'm, if I'm going to buy my next house, I sell my first house. Um, and over the last decade, we've had this phenomenon where we double up, you know, like mortgage rates are 3%. I'm going to buy my next house and keep my first house because I can, I can do two mortgages and now I have an investment property. Right. And so we've taken a lot of homes out of the active inventory and just kept them as in investment properties over the decade, like like eight million homes over the last decade wow. have done that. And so now with everybody at a two point eight percent or three percent or lower, it's really hard, even if you're moving to to let go of that existing loan. So that's one thing. Right. So that that normal. And then and we also know that. Uh, there's a lot fewer moving happening. So they're simply like, I'm just here for a while. And, and so that you have that. So that, that part of uh, the, what would normally be creating inventory um, isn't happening. We're just holding on to them. They're cheap. They're cheap forever. I'm holding on to them. Uh, the other thing though, there would be a couple other places where you might find inventory come. One would be um, investors who are saying like, Oh, you know, um, cost of money is up. These properties no longer uh, are penciling out for me. Therefore, I want to, I'm going to unload them. And so in a slowing economy or in a rising rate environment, one place we, we might expect inventory to come from would be from investors. And it turns out none of them are selling yet. Not even the big ones who've stopped buying. So no inventory yet from any of those guys. And then the third place you might find it would be distressed inventory. So recession, I lose my job, I can't, you know, I can no longer make this mortgage payment, I got to sell the house. And in a, you know, when a recession hits, um, you know, it's about, you think about like, I'm out of work for 90 days, now I stop paying my mortgage for 90 days, now I'm in the foreclosure process. It's like six, nine, 12 months before that inventory comes to market. And, and we, ha we don't have job losses yet. So there's none of that inventory. So there's no distressed inventory. There's no investor inventory. And there's very few of the people who are, uh, are moving. And even if they are moving, a lot of them are still holding on to their, 
their you know existing place. My brother just moved is moving to Pennsylvania from DC um, to be you know take care of their in laws and and they're keeping their house in DC because you know it's on the metro and you know it's it's got a two percent mortgage rate and like we're just going to keep that thing forever. And so, um, so like you have the, all three of those phenomena happening at the same time. So all we have are a little bit of those life events, divorce and job change. And I've got to sell this one to put the down payment on the next one. And those are the things that we see. Um, but even the, you know, move, selling your house because you got to move for a job. Fewer people have to move for jobs these days. Right. So right. like, like all of the things are, are leading to us to have significantly fewer inventory, uh, especially relative to the amount of people who want to, you know, buy them. Yeah. It seems like given your analysis there, which all makes total sense to me, it doesn't sound like it's going to shoot up anytime soon. These seem like longer term trends. Of course, as you've caveated and said several times, Major job losses, you know, a big recession in the second half of the year could change a lot of this. But do you see it continuing? Uh, there are no signals anywhere in the data of any surge in inventory. Um, you know, there's a lot of the, you know, the YouTube class that talks about housing crash and, <laughs> you know, that those kind of folks. Um, and they're looking, always looking for like, oh, here comes the inventory. Like it's, you know, and there's no signals anywhere in the data yet that that's coming, uh, that, that that's coming. Um, I could imagine, like, I could imagine more homes on the market. Like we have a slow down, you have a, you know, you have job loss. Like we, we can imagine when there would be more inventory coming. I was expecting it to happen already this year. It happened, it grew last year. Um, so, uh, so you can imagine, especially in a recession that we would have more inventory. My gut says that because the people who have rates super low, even if when you're losing your job, you're going to fight like hell to hold on to that, which is the complete opposite uh, from the 2008 time when you had a lousy, you had lousy terms. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you do is walk away from that when you lose your job. And so my gut says that even in that, that, um, you know, a, a hard recession, we still don't get that much, uh, distressed inventory. We still don't get that much, you know, investors like investor selling. So, but, but a gradual, especially if rates stay in the fives or sixes, that means that, you know, over time, we get a little bit building, uh, you know, that is slightly less affordable to hold. So I sell it. Um, you get a little, you get those building over time. So yeah, I see it as a multi-year thing. Um, and, you know, like, we look like I'm, we're watching for all of the signals. Where are they coming? <laughs> I just don't see yeah. it. <laughs> Okay, great. That that's super helpful to know. It's a, you know a very very good analysis, and I, it's, everything you're saying makes sense to me. I have one last question for you. I get this question all the time, as I'm guessing you do too. And we've hit on pieces of this, but let me just ask you directly: Can housing prices decline when inventory is low? Uh, the answer is yes. Housing prices can decline when inventory is low. It's the the supply demand curve can find a new equilibrium uh, it, at low inventory. Um, what we're finding now is that uh, demand is sufficient that that the low supply is keeping a floor on prices on you know prices from falling. Um, you know, you see like if prices fall you know, a little bit further in, in Phoenix and suddenly, you know, cap rates go to from four to five, like there's money there for that. If they go to six, they're buying everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So like you can see, especially in, in that uh, investor buy box, you know, range of 150 to 400, like it's, it's uh, th there's, there is right now, there seems to me like a lot of capital, ready to buy those anytime there's a bargain coming in there. And, and I actually have a, on my podcast that with Altos, I talk with investor types and I say like, do we, do we see that investors are going to exacerbate a downturn or are they going to put a floor in? 
Are they going to sell because they're panicking or are they going to buy because they have cash on them? And that's like a question that I'm that I'm interested in, in, you know, other people's takes on. As of right now, it looks like the cash is putting a floor on that. And so um, the answer is home prices can go down, you know, with low supply and low demand. You know, it happened last year. Um, but uh, but uh, the, there seems to be a lot of cash and a lot of momentum for uh, that that is keeping a supply you know a, a floor on prices given the current level of supply. Got it. Thank you. I, I, that's a super helpful answer, and I think people should should really think about that, especially if they listen to some people on YouTube, like you said, <laughs> talking and obsessing about inventory. It's helpful to know like what it actually means for housing prices. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a pleasure. Uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more? So uh, they can follow me on Twitter, Mike Simonson. Uh, they can watch our Altos Research YouTube channel. Every Monday we do videos with the data, like here's what's happening across the country. Um, and, and, I, and so both of those places, Altos Research on YouTube and, and Mike Simonson on Twitter or, or LinkedIn. Um, and then go to altosresearch.com and you can, you know, check data and, you know, connect with our team. And, you know, especially if you're, you know, it's like, huh, I need to get data for my local market. That's what you do. All right. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. And hopefully we'll have you back sometime soon. Looking forward to it, Dave. Thanks so much. Big thanks to Mike for joining us for On the Market. I really enjoyed that conversation and think that there's a lot to learn from Mike. It's his, his take on the market is obviously really important. But I think the beginning of the conversation where we talked about the importance of data and learning how to segment data for your market uh, is Something that will benefit you for a lifetime of investing if you're into that. If you start, you know, just taking a little bit of time to look at how different trends are going on in your market, not just at a Mac, you know, at a level where you could say rents went up in in Miami or whatever. If you could identify that rents for one bedrooms or two bedrooms um, are differing than studios, it can really help you make decisions and refine your buy box in a really significant way. Um, and so I, I, I encourage you all to do that. And I did just want to provide you with a couple of resources where you can find that sort of information. So Mike's company, obviously, Altos Research, does provide a lot of this information. Some of the big MLS providers like Redfin and Zillow and Realtor.com also provide pretty good up to the week data um, about local markets. Um, so you could check those out. And I'd also encourage you to look on bigger pockets. I pretty much about once a quarter put out rent reports that break down rent trends, not just by market, but you know, within a market, one bedrooms versus two bedrooms, single family homes versus apartments. And so you can start to learn and get the data for some of these subsectors of your individual market. So I encourage you all to check those out. Um, not all of Mike's data is free on Altos, but they do provide a lot. Um, the other resources that I cited like Zillow and Redfin and Bigger Pockets, are free. So um, you could check all of that out. Thank you all for listening. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, one of the things we really benefit from um, on this channel is people sharing with their friends the episodes that they like. So if this is one that you really like, please go ahead and share it on social media or just with an individual you think would benefit from this episode. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal, and a big thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.